So this is the UC Emeriti Oral History Project. Uh, would you please introduce yourself? I'm Barbara Ramusak, and I came to Cincinnati in 1967 after I accepted a position as an assistant professor in the history department to teach the history of India, where I did my dissertation research, China, and Japan. Oh, wow. Okay. What was the hiring process like? Well, I only actually had one on-campus interview, which was Cincinnati, and it was very informal, like no one met me at the airport. They said, you know, take a taxi, and so I took a taxi and, and spent the first night by myself, and then um, someone was supposed to pick me up for breakfast, and I was to leave this, that same day of the uh, interview. So um, I was all prepared and everything, but didn't have breakfast, and the person didn't show up. And so then my first interview was with the dean, and his first question was, um, what did I think of the retirement policy? And I had not looked at the retirement policy, and I said, oh, I think that it is, it sounds very good. <laughs> and so the questions, it was, he was, a, I think, a biologist, and it was just evident that he really didn't know too much about India, China, or Japan. And so um, it was sort of a, a it was not a, a, you know, a smooth introduction. Then I was taken around to visit with various um, history professors and a political science professor who taught about um, India. And um, for example, I, I tried to go to the restroom and the restroom doors for the faculty women, there were separate restrooms for faculty women, were locked. And so finally, I got back to the history office and I went in and asked the secretary, I said, I don't know where the, I can get into a bathroom. Can I go into a student bathroom? She said, you mean those men didn't give you a key? And I said, no, they didn't. So she took care of me. So that it was obvious that they were doing um, an interview with you know, a species that they hadn't done before. I knew that they had interviewed for the job the previous year and people had rejected it because they were all men and they didn't want to teach, the Chinese uh, trained people didn't want to teach India and vice versa for the India. So it was my first job interview and so they said you can do it. And I said, well, yes, I had had a field in Chinese history, I had Indian history, and I had had, I didn't tell them this, I said I had a course in Japan history and I had half of a course in Japan history. <laughs> so that's how the hiring process. And then they took me to lunch and they kept asking me questions and I can remember it was an African American woman who was a waitress said, now you men be quiet and talk among yourselves, she's got to eat. This is a difficult pie for her. So that it was nice to find another woman on campus. Right. So then the other thing is, which would I don't think anyone realized, the head of the department offered me the position before I went to talk to the faculty because traditionally when you're being interviewed, your last interview is with the faculty sort of off the record and they will are supposedly to vote, I thought. And uh, maybe they did vote, but it was, I had an, an initial offer. And the only, I didn't bargain about salary. I didn't know you were supposed to do that. And the only thing I bargained about is they wanted me to teach um, a year-long upper division course on India. They wanted me to teach a course on um, South Asia, which would be India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, that. And then they wanted me to also do a Western Civ and to do China and Japan. Well, they wanted an Asian history course, which would have one quarter India, one quarter China, one quarter Japan. But at the same time, they wanted me to do a the course on um, world history that started with ancient Egypt and came up to, and I said, I could do this, but could we do two years of, or, I mean, two courses of uh, Asian history survey my first year, and then the next year that I would do the uh, world history. And so they said, yeah, the, 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 the uh, department had called me back the next morning and said yes. And so instead of 8,500, he told me I would get 9,000. So that's where I knew I would get $9,000. So um, I have my PhD from the University of Michigan and I had just returned from being um, 18 months in India and five months in, about four months in England doing research. 
Um, so I've been outside the United States, and as probably most people remember, that was a very, very taut time in political things because mainly of the situation in Vietnam. Right. And so in Ann Arbor, which where I was doing my work and I returned, I mean, it was a very, um, uh, you know, a, a, I guess you would say a bowl of protest against the government's policy in Vietnam. And um, I was uh, involved in some of those things. And so when I came to Cincinnati, I um, uh, became active in the Democratic Party at the very lowest level at uh, the precinct, going around um, campaigning for Eugene McCarthy. And I had doors slammed in my face, <laughs> and I had, and I was just going to Democrats because they gave me a list of where the Democrats were in right. Tifton, in my precinct. And what was my precinct is now two precincts. <laughs> they, uh, and I would go around, and the Democrats were in for Jackson, and I did meet one person who was for um, Eugene McCarthy. But in the history department, there were people who were supporting Eugene McCarthy, and I became quite good friends with them. Um, uh, Zane Miller, who was our urban historian, and um, the two Shapiros. We had Herbert Shapiro and Henry Shapiro, and they were both very staunch. So I was um, signing uh, or get, getting peti uh, people to sign my petition to be a precinct executive. So there was a lot of debate on campus about the Vietnam War yeah. and the, or our involvement in it. And the thing is, what I was amazed at, and I won't mention any names, is that there were history people who were very strongly supporting the war and there were people who were not supporting the war. And there was one time we had um, a dinner at a, a restaurant, the Wigwam, and afterwards there, the men were shouting at each other, and I thought possibly going to fight each other, but people took them apart. So that within the history department, there were people who supported the president, and there were people who supported McCarthy. So that it was, uh, you know, you were politically involved, but at the same time, I tried to be very, you know, let's say legal and not be too loud because I was a woman and at that time when I the year I came in the College of Arts and Science there were only 14 women who were tenure-track women there was one Margaret Fulford who was in botany there was uh, a woman who taught uh, German literature how the Slezarev and then there was a woman teaching um, uh, the Romance languages, but she was a specialist on uh, Spain. So that was in arts and science, and then the rest of us were all first year arts, uh, first year assistant professors, and mainly in the humanities. I don't think there was. I know there wasn't anybody in science. So there were only 14 women in all of arts and science, and I think that you know maybe there were 150 faculty, 100. Because at that time, UC was still a state, uh, a city school, yeah. and so there was the um, Vietnam War, and there will be other things that I'll say about that. But I think it's important to remember that uh, Cincinnati was a city school. It was a very old city school mm -hmm. compared to the other city schools, like in Toledo and Akron and place, places like that. So, but the those started to go state because they didn't they couldn't survive on the taxes from the city but people in Cincinnati said we want them to buy our campus we don't want to just give all that land away and so there was a strong um, backlash against going state but we at that time were getting some subsidies from the state so we did eventually go state but it was later than the others and it was really about the early 1970s and then I, there, we'd been hiring a lot of people. We had 31 uh, people in the history department tenure track when I came. But part of it was our classes were bursting at the seams because um, during the Vietnam War, you could get, um, you could delay being on the draft list by coming to UC. Yeah. And so our classes were filled with a lot of young men. We had young women too. But it was, that's why we couldn't support 31. But then the, I don't know whether you want to say recession, but of the 1970s, things got really bad. And so um, 
people started, um, and the war sort of was winding down. So it was very difficult because if somebody left or didn't get tenure on the faculty, the, the uh, history department started to uh, become much smaller. And then, if I think it was maybe by 1972 to 1976, 77, we didn't hire anyone. So that you, you had, your classes were still large, but there were fewer of them. And um, so that was one thing that was happening. And then there were other things that had tremendous impact um, on uh, the university. And first of all, it was the one in 4th of, Feb of April, 1960. Eight with the death of Martin Luther King, right. and that after that evening, I was on my way to a Democratic pre um, district um, thing for uh, the um, you know the, the uh, local people, and it was over in um, Western Hills, and I came and we we went into the auditorium there or the room where we were meeting, and we were told that Dr. King was dead. How did you feel? I felt I was just appalled. How could this happen in the United States? That you know someone's going to be shot down like that. And so they said, "We're dissolving the meeting. Go home." Well, I needed gas, so I stopped at it. There were several. There were more than one gas station on Clifton Hills, uh, not Clifton Hills, on uh, Parkway, on Central Parkway. So I stopped for gas, and the man said, "What are you doing out here? You should be at home." going to explode. And I said, I'm on my way home, but I need gas to get home, so yes. that's why I'm here. And so I went home, and I mean, it was, you know, just unbelievable, the protests against what would, what had happened, right. and we didn't know what was happening. And then also that, and I can't remember for sure, well, I, I remember that. Then the next day, I remember um, there was a, a curfew in yeah. Cincinnati, so that they were trying to keep it under control. Was there a lot of like rioting or something? Or there, there was a, there was a certain amount of rioting. It okay. was, it, it would be a little bit worse. I mean, there was rioting, and yeah. I was trying to check whether someone died because I know someone died. They were going down. Um, it, it was, it was over east of the university, and they were somebody from the university was shot, and I can't remember wow. whether it was after. The death of Martin Luther King, or after the Kent State killings. Yeah, and so I mean, people were dying, and you know, faculty, and you know, they were just. Um, I, the person who was killed in, um, it's the area next. Uh, it was going over towards uh, where now 71 is, and they were going down the hill there, and it was just you know. You, you were afraid, and people said, well, why are you doing this? You can't do this, but, you know, I was driving. <laughs> and that really uh, created, you know, a, a lot of, uh, I think, you know, protest marches. And I remember Dabney Glenn Park, uh, who was hired the same year I was, and but later left the university, that, you know, he was p participating in uh, the protest. So that really, uh, you know, was something that I never thought would happen in the United States, but right. it did. And I was, uh, you know, involved, but I wasn't involved in a very public way um, on that time. Because, I mean, teaching three courses when you had no T, and I had no TA, the people in um, American, U.S. history or European, they had um, TAs to help with grading. Yeah. And you, you had 70 people in your class, and I had two classes of that. so. I was, you know, really keeping my nose to the grindstone there. Um, and then the other, uh, the next thing, which I just couldn't get over, were the killings at Kent State. And that was on the 4th of May, 1970. And I was actually in Ann Arbor because I was, um, I was giving my midterm exams and so I could have someone do that. And I had gone up to Ann Arbor to um, talk with my uh, dissertation because I was just finishing up, well, I just finished up uh, my uh, dissertation and defended it. So um, that I was up in Ann Arbor and it, I didn't know about it until we were at dinner celebrating that I was finished and um, the waiter came up and said, there have been these killings at Kent State. And I remember the people said, it's going to explode. 
it, the campuses are just going to explode. So I came back um, to Cincinnati, and I forget whether it was on, it must, might have been Saturday or something, um, and there were riots in the city. And um, the uh, police had, and there were protests on campus, and the, the people asked the police for greater protection, and the police said they couldn't. You had oh. to get the National Guard. Well, the National Guard had just killed students on a campus up in uh, Kent State. So, I mean, that was not the answer. So that also just opened up much more protest. And so, I mean, you had to be very careful if you were going around. And, you know, you wondered what in the heck is happening to your country that you're killing people on a campus who have no arms, who have, you know, are right. threatening anyone, who are protesting. And um, the, as I say, the, that was something that sort of seared you for life on that and, um, you know, made you more active. Well, and then the university was attempting to deal with what had happened. And um, at first, classes were canceled. And I remember one thing that we had, there was a Korean woman in the history department who was working for her PhD. And we were not supposed to go to campus. And she was due to have her oral exams, her so-called prelims. Yeah. And um, we weren't supposed to go on campus, but we thought we had to wait. Well, we're not supposed to be teaching. And we were told we weren't supposed to be teaching. We weren't supposed to be teaching. And so what could we do for this woman? She had to go back. And if she didn't have her exams, we couldn't say that she had entered candidacy. And so we held them in one of the, across the street, in one of the religious um, groups that, you know, were student-oriented. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was the Presbyterians or what. I know it wasn't the Jewish one or the Catholic one, but it, it, was, it was one of them. And so, you know, you're feeling like, am I, am I going against the law, the law? Because, you know, we were supposed to be, you know, on countdown or something, you know, that we weren't supposed to go near the university. And, you know, we, so we did it and, you know, she was a candidate. Unfortunately, she, you know, when she went back, she didn't have time to work on her dissertation, so she never got to be, uh, you know, get the PhD. But we did feel good that she could take this back and, you know, but it, it was very, um, very difficult. And um, so there were all of these meetings on camp. There were, well, then finally we got to meet on campus and we were having meetings and everything. So then that was when um, a university senate was established and it was to con have uh, administrators, faculty, and students to bring people together and to, you know, try and cross those categories. And um, it was to include those groups and the first three chairs of it were history professors. Really? The first one was Jean Lewis, oh. <laughs> and the second one was Zane Miller, and the th but they were professors. Mm -hmm. I was an assistant professor. I was a woman, and so um, they made Zane said, "Oh well, you have to be chair of the fa of the uh, university senate." And I said, "Oh, I'm not prepared for this." And he <laughs> said, "Oh no, you can do it. Don't worry." And so I became the chair of, but by that time, things are starting to settle down. Yeah. And um, so we did have, um, you know, a lot of discussions. And I think what was something that I never anticipated, um, one day I was in um, my office, which wasn't, or I was asked to go to an office of the um, head of student affairs. And I met with a group of males, students, and mainly they were from CCM. And they were concerned about having um, the discrimination that they felt, which was against gay men. Yeah. And so they said, "Well, what we or what the uh, person in uh, said, you know, maybe we could who was in student affairs said, you know, can't you do something on uh, the university senate?" And I said, "Well, you know, I don't know. We have some." faculty that I'm not sure, you know, they seem to be somewhat conservative where they would be yeah. on this. So I said, but I'll try it. And so it was, I think, I can't remember, it's either the next to the last meeting or the last meeting. And I was really scared. I was really scared. And I thought, what in the heck is going to happen here? So we 
you know, we did other business, and then we had this discussion about this resolution for non-discrimination, including sexual orientation, and it passed. Oh, it's amazing. I was amazed because it was hard, you know, I didn't feel that I could do talking, or, you know, that I could talk or I could advocate, which way I was definitely for it, but I thought I didn't want, you know, people to say that I was trying to coerce them. And even if I just was talking to them, they might come back and say, oh, you know, she was trying to coerce us. And so we did have it. And I think it's important to know that we had it on campus. And when we had um, interviewed people in the history department, I always made sure that they knew. And there was one person I'm not going to name who was gay at that time and said that they thought, you know, it was, you know, they didn't say at that time. I didn't know that. You know that person was gay, yeah. and so um, they. But later found out and said that was something why they wanted. The other thing, which I think is interesting, you know, in the city, um, they had passed a resolution no discrimination against gays, and then it had been rescinded. Really? Yeah. And I was trying to think. I couldn't find the date. It was rescinded. It was defeated. That we have this in our city charter, and I thought, you know, we way back when we had it in. The university and I mean there wasn't any, there was publicity it was the only time I got my name in the newspaper that we had passed it and I didn't know if I could send that home to my parents <laughs> so I didn't um, and the thing is that uh, you know so that there were things at the university that were happening that were positive too um, and that the university was ahead of the city and at the same time, what you have to realize is that it was a transition, and also that was a time in the 1970s when the AAUP got to be much more, um, have much more power and, you know, involved and not just be sort of, you know, talking about what we should do, but doing it. Yeah, were you and, involved in that? Um, no, I was for a little while, and then I thought I have to, um, I was supportive of it, but the thing, I, I didn't do a lot of overt work for it because okay. I just thought I had too much. I'm trying to get tenure, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And um, it was, and, and also I was active in a lot of Asian, um, or South, particularly South Asia, which is India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, that sort of area, yeah. in uh, the events off campus because there was no one I could really talk to. And so I felt that I needed that, and so I got involved with that. And I was in the head of the research committee on the Punjab, and I was I got involved in um, all of the middle uh, uh, I forget what it's called, but it was like the Asian studies of the mid Midwest, Midwest Asian studies thing. So I was involved in things that related to my research and my teaching, because while all of this is going on, I. Um, finished my dissertation in, and defended it, well I finished it earlier, but defended it in 1969. And so then there's the pressure to start publishing articles and things like that. So um, with the AUP it wasn't that I wasn't in favor of it, and initially I, I did a couple of things with it, but then I didn't because I thought I have, to, you know, I'm spreading myself too thin anyway. Right. So and I mean teaching, and then after the first year because um, my classes were filled when I was doing two of Asian, then I was doing two of Asian history. And that was a lot because I had no TA. And then also within the department, um, I had gotten, I, I, I started on a one year contract and the next year I was only renewed for a year. And so I went to the department head and said, you know, I thought I would get a two-year renewal after. And he said, well, um, I said, you know, what are the guidelines? What do I have, to, what didn't I do that I could get it? And he said, well, we really don't have any guidelines. I said, oh, that was Professor William Eschbacher, Bill Eschbacher. And he was new. Um, and so then um, he, he appointed a committee to, um, uh, 
formulate what should be the criteria for promotion at various levels. Hmm. And he named me chair of it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, if you talk up, they're going to say, well, you can do it. Yeah. And he, but he was very astute because, you know, the ones who have the most to win or lose with that are the assistant professors who don't have tenure. So he put two, of, he took, put another professor on, um, I think it was John Alexander, and then there were um, two faculty and George Ingbert, and I think maybe the other, I forget the other one, but anyway. So there were four faculty, one full professor, one associate, and two assistant, and I was chair. <laughs> so we, we did, um, you know, give guidelines about what we thought you were appropriate for you to do. And you know, it wasn't ironclad in any way, you know, you could yeah. probably make an argument one way or the other, but um, at least we finally had something that you had to do. And so actually, when I came up for promotion to associate, well, I came up a year early for promotion to um, as associate professor because I had published an article in our major journal, Journal of Asian Studies, and I guess my students were revolting. I mean, my, 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 um, I think my Asian, I know my agency, of course, was very difficult for students. I mean, I tried to make it, you know, easier for them. But um, every once in a while, and not so much now because I'm so old, but um, I would be in Brugger's and people would come up and say, you know, Professor Ramasek, your course was really hard. <laughs> I said, well, I know it was unfamiliar material. He said, but you know, I learned something. And I said, oh, good, I'm glad to hear that. And I said, it'll be helpful if you want to go to India and travel or anything. Yeah. But so I know that, um, my, uh, you know, that my, I was doing something that they had never heard of. Like if you're doing, I mean, and John Alexander was a fabulous teacher and so, you know, everybody wanted to take American history from John. And um, I, but you know, I, I was in a different, whole different, uh, you know, a different personality too. So, um, but I knew that, uh, you know, and like even during the Afghan war, um, I had a student and he said, you know, I really wish I had this course before I went to Afghanistan. He said, I would have a better idea of what was happening there. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was hired, I think, as a woman because I was doing something that was, you know, they didn't know what, what to do about it. But so I did spend a lot of time, um, you know, in um, other groups like the Midwest Conference. I went every year at Associate Association for Asian Studies a lot of times to the history. And so in my career, I ended up, um, actually I think I'm the only person from the department who has gotten, um, uh, who was a faculty member in my time, which starts from 1967, um, you know, yeah. who was elected to the overall council of the American Historical Association. Really? How'd you yeah. do that? I got elected. People ask me, I mean, you know, people ask me, well, how did you get elected? You're not from a big university. And I said, I guess people voted for me. <laughs> you know, that's all you can say. And, uh -huh. um, and I was very active in them, uh, in the American Historical Association, because the woman who went off to be the first uh, woman president of Harvard had started a um, group to talk about how to improve conditions for um, part-time and non-tenure track people. Because like there were stories like some places they didn't even have Xerox privileges, they didn't have an office, they didn't have a place to put their coat. And you know, they had a very, very low pay and you know, nothing that would make it a little easier for them. So there were um, 10 um, associations like political science and economics and things like that. I don't know if it was economics, but it was political science and a lot of, you know, literature and things. And so we met for over two years. And it's interesting, all but one of the sort of heads who were running the operation, plus me and a, a two, uh, one, I think one or two faculty, we were all women. Really? Because, we, because it was mainly women who were working part time and you know getting paid, you know, twenty five hundred dollars for you know teaching the course, and expected to do all of this grading and everything, and so um, we you know 
drew up guidelines that were printed within the uh, and uh, the uh, you know the monthly uh, thing of the American Historical Association, and I was on various other committees for him in terms of book prizes and you know things like that. That that was before I was on the, the uh, council itself, and was doing that. And so the same thing in the Association for Asian Studies. Um, I was elected in uh, the South Asia group, and then I got enough votes so that I was on the, uh, the, the, the top council. So there was one Chinese specialist, one Japanese, one Southeast Asia, one um, South Asia, and what was the last one? I forget now. But anyway, um, Southeast Asia, South Asia, China, Japan, and then, you know. And so anyway, uh, you know, it was very awkward at times because these were very senior men and also for them you know South Asia it was you know or Asia was just you know or South Asia that wasn't important right so that or Asia wasn't important because I on this on the historian thing I was the Asianist on the um, the one for South Asia um, the Association of Asian Studies I was South Asia so there was two things, and so I saw how those things operated, and was, you know, most probably involved with. But I was involved in other things than the women's issues. Um, so that and that takes a lot of time away from your research, and you know, if you're teaching a, a, a heavy load, that takes a lot. But then we eventually got to the two two, so that two two two. So that was easier. What's two, two, two? Uh, I mean, two, two classes each semester. I mean, each quarter. Okay. You know, because when I came in, we taught three classes each semester. Then we got to two. Oh, okay. So and and theoretically, in a research university in Cincinnati, was trying to say yes, we are a research university. Yeah. Then you get a lighter teaching load. Right. Because you're going to conferences and you know doing a lot of research and see I had to go to India to do my research oh my goodness. and I did I did a lot of research in London too but most of it hardcore research was in India and that you know getting visas it, it getting all of your shots and you know whatever your inoculations that you need and everything so that it's you know it's a challenge and it's time consuming so that um, but you know I'm glad I did it and. You know, I really in, uh, learned a lot, and you know, l met many people there and have friends. You know, and then also, see, I attracted. Um, I was away. Uh, I was in India, and there were uh, there was an Indian woman who applied here to come to UC, and that was in the 80s. And um, she, they. They said, oh, you have someone who wants to come here, but we're not getting her, her uh, transcript. Well, I, I came back from India, and I guess I was in uh, London or something, and I came home for some reason. And so they said, you know, we've got this one from India, but it's not the one, you know, this Paula Banerjee. And I said, well, this is Paula Banerjee, but the, the University of Calcutta uses the Bengali spelling of her name. So it was Paula Chattopadhyaya. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there were those things. So she was my first student, and then there was a, she had a friend, and that student came the next year. And see, I had to have students who came with their language because we didn't have any language teaching in the Indian languages. And so, um, and then I established a reputation in India for my research because I met some of the women who were doing research. And um, I was doing, um, working at first on princely states in India and then I was doing work on women. Um, I a second field that I developed was looking at efforts to improve female and infant mortality. And so I was doing women's history and I was doing princely state history and I was writing, I was in a, uh, an effort to do a book on South, on all of um, sort of the non-Western world and women. And there were five books. There was one on Middle East. There was one on um, South, uh, on Asia. There was one on Latin America. And um, now I forget the other two, but there were, there were five of them, Latin America. And um, so the thing is that I was doing a lot externally 
as well as a lot, you know, and a lot that focused on content, and then a lot that was service, service, and then teaching. And but I ended up uh, having six Indian students, women, who came to study women's history with me, and I'm proud to say they all have jobs. Awesome. And some of them are now uh, full professors. One is at um, Northern Arizona, where our new dean of arts and science is from. And um, so that was uh, Sanja Malawalia. My first one was Paula Banerjee. And uh, then there was one that doesn't communicate with me. I don't know. And um, let's see, Paula. And then Uma Ganesan. And uh, there's one more. So. The thing is, how could I forget that? Oh, um, anyway, I'll think about it and I'll come up with it. Yeah. Um, so that you know, I I feel very fulfilled at UC that I've been able to have these graduate students um, who are now all teaching, um, one in India and four in the United States. I know one that I don't hear from teaches at Shippensburg. Chandrika Paul is her name, and. Um, so then um, there's the one from uh, Arizona State. Oh, there's one at University of um, Massachusetts at Amherst. So that, you know, they, they have, and they're all, they're all, no, one more is going to be tenured. So that four of them are, uh, five of them are tenured and one more will be tenured. That's great. So that that's good. Yeah. And so I like that. And the other thing that I really, um, tried, worked with people, and it wasn't a conscious thing, but we were getting um, students, women students who had married young, had their children, and wanted to come back to the university. And so I know in, I think, I know in two cases, in one case, uh, the person had applied um, elsewhere, and they wouldn't take, well, one had applied to, um, uh, they said uh, that they were uh, rejected and so I said you know I, I looked at their things and I said it looks and so I took them but then there was also when I, I was twice director of graduate studies some people are never director of graduate studies I was twice I mean but I liked working with graduate students so it was fine but it was time-consuming because you you got a course load reduction but it took it took a lot out of you to, to do that and um, so this woman um, called and said, you know, uh, she was interested in this and she was 39 and, you know, would I be, con would she be considered? And she wasn't considered at other places. They said no to her because she was too old. Really? And I said, well, I will personally see that you get full consideration. Yeah. And so maybe I was department head and it was, and so I followed it through. And she did get, uh, she, she got in. And she's in, I think, Kansas. She's in the middle part. And she's very active in um, all sorts of things about, you know, pipelines going through, uh, you know, territory where they shouldn't be going through. And so that, you know, I, I feel like as director of graduate studies, there were also students in department head. And I was the first woman department head. And that was, and, and the thing is, I never wanted to be department head. <laughs> but, you know, your turn comes and, you know, you sort of serve. And because it, it, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. And, you know, you're, the, the um, administrators tell, the, the dean tells the apartment, you know, the, the, the president tells the provost what he or she wants. The provost tells the dean. The dean tells the department head. I have to tell the students at the bottom, I mean the faculty at the bottom, and also sometimes the students, but the faculty at the bottom, and then they say, well, we don't want to do that, <laughs> or we think that's not a good idea. And I said, well, that's what it is, <laughs> so we have to work around this and try. So that, you know, at various times I've been in the middle of things, where I didn't want to be in the middle of things. But, you know, you, you survive, and so, you know, you just keep going, and you hope that you're having a, um, you know, a major, uh, or not a major, but just having some impact on people's lives. Right. How are we doing for time? We're good so far, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. We're good, we're, do we're doing oh, okay. good. Okay, we're doing okay. Um, the thing is, uh, I think, well, another thing that I'm very proud of is that when, in the 70s, 
when we were meeting in women's groups, um, I mean, we were looking at such things as, first of all, the development of women's studies. Did I, I haven't said anything about women's studies. No, okay, haven't. women's studies. And that was in 1974. And so we needed people to teach classes. And Betsy Sato was here. She was teaching Japanese history. And then she later left that position. She went in, she was director of AUP for many years. She got, well, she got very active in it. And it was hard to be, you know, and so uh, both teaching and being active in AUP at the level that she was. Yeah. So that um, she uh, didn't go, uh, she didn't stay in the academic position. And so um, we established in 1984, we had, you know, and we had support from the provost who was a, a law professor. We had provost from the president we had. So we had support. But at, the, at that time, the, um, if you, any new course had to be approved by the faculty of arts and science. So then you had to make a presentation. So Betsy and I made a presentation, and um, the, some of the faculty were not happy with the course. They said, what are you going to do? You're not going to have enough sources. It's, you know, this isn't going to be like American history or European history, you know, it's not. And um, so we said, okay, no, this is going to be academic, you know, in India would say, Paka mean perfect, but you know, it's going to be academic. Yeah. It's going to be academic. So we were doing, we were team teaching a course, and it was on women in India, China, and Japan. And so to make sure that it was seen as valid, we were assigning about 250 pages every week for oh, wow. them to read. And they had to do various lengths of papers. Sometimes it was a longer one, sometimes it was a shorter one. And so everyone did their reading. I mean, because the students were really committed to, and I mean, it was a seminar, I think there were like maybe 10, 12 students in it. It was hard because you were getting all these papers to read, and you too had to read all these books and know them, you know, to lead the discussion. So one time Betsy would be in charge, and then one time I would be in charge. And, but we were both sitting in the class and everything. So that was the way in which we started you know, women's studies. Other people started in other departments, and it was mainly, we had uh, people in sociology, in English. Robin Shields was, oh, Robert Sheets was a superb uh, teacher in um, English literature. And at that time, um, the, even the president uh, taught a course with her because he was interested in English history. That's great. And so, you know, you, um, it, it, but now, now pr presidents don't teach at all. And so I think that, you know, it would be good if they taught <laughs> at least one common? course a year. Did that used to be more common for presidents to teach? Yeah, I mean, but it was, this is back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, now, now and, and I realize they have a million things to do. And, you know, maybe just once in their term, or I mean their entire term, go yeah. in and teach a course and see what, what it is. And, you know, um, it, it, I, I think it would be good for them because they did used to do, not, 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 a, not a lot. And some, I don't think you would want to teach the course, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they did teach the course. So that was how it started. Another thing that we had, um, that women agitated for, it was in the 1970s that there were, 70s or 80s, I think it was 70s. There were in law school. There were only seven percent of the students were women. Now women, I think, are almost in a majority in wow. law school. There were only four percent in medicine. And so you know, you've come a long way with uh, the, avail the availability of um, you know that there are more options for women nowadays. Um, but I mean, it. it it, it just and like when I was at the University of Michigan to show something really bad, they uh, in 1960-61 they had uh, eight or nine hundred um, students in the law school, which is one of the top law schools, not like Harvard or Yale, but still up right. there. And um, they had only uh, eight 
there was eight or ten women in the Oh my goodness. And one of them was, I, we were all in a dorm, and um, they, she was in the room next door with another roommate, and so I was with somebody who was in uh, speech. But, you know, it was amazing because we thought we had it bad in terms of graduate school. But, you know, in the, in the graduate programs, because there weren't a lot of women going on for PhDs in history when I did. They would come for um, their masters and go into high school teaching. And then there was one more conservative professor that I would say, he thought, well, women could get a PhD because it would make them a better high school teacher. And that there was no, you know, so th that's, that's the sort of thing that it was back in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s. So that, you know, it, it's really changed and, you know, a lot for the good. Um, was the pay between men and women different when you taught? Yes, because um, what happened to me, uh, you know, I got my $9,000. Yeah. And um, then I got my raise. And I, as I say, I went up, I got promoted in my sixth year instead of my seventh year. So yeah. I went up in my fifth year. And I got my raise. And then the next year, at that time, they would put it in your mailbox. And so I was, I can remember there used to be a meat market, very, very good on Ludlow, right next, well, where the, um, oh, the, the, the sort of the tea room, well, it's a very, been, been a variety of things. But you know, on the, you have the clothing store, and then you have um, sort of like a, I, I, I think they have alcoholic drinks, a coffee shop there and they've sort of cleaned it up. But anyway, um, there used to be a, a meat market there. And so I went in and I'm standing in the meat market and I'm opening up my envelope and I'm thinking, oh, I'm probably going to get, you know, $200 as my raise. And I got $1,500. Oh, wow. And so I took it the next day to Dr. Eschbacher and I said, Dr. Eschbacher, they've made a mistake here. And he said, Barbara, you were underpaid. I didn't have any, I didn't have, I couldn't do anything about it, but the provost did something about it. So that, I mean, you know, so I know I was being paid less than the men when I started and when, um, you know, I was, so then, it, you know, it just keeps you down. So that there wasn't that, but I think that from what I know, you know, and the salaries are now published, um, and but I don't, you know, go in and look and see what they are. Yeah. But I think that women are probably, you know, doing better uh, than we did before. But that was something, you know, and so you had to have someone who felt that they, you know, could do that from their budget. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Um, well, I think that, um, and well, there were other things that, uh, you know, happened to me, um, and I don't know if they're relevant, you can say we don't really have to talk about that. For example, <laughs> in terms of getting an international reputation, um, it was Christmas Eve and I happened to be here and I got this call, and it's from uh, the curator at the, um, of South Asia at the Victoria and Albert Museum, wow. and he said, we would like you to be the keynote speaker. We're having an exhibit on Maharajas, and you've done a, a book on the Maharaja, and you, uh, and I was also, my first book um, was on what was happening to the Indian princes who were a client of the British when the balance of power is going from the British to the Indian nationalists, because what's going to happen to these princes? So I did it from, oh, about 19, I think about 1910 to uh, about 1935, uh, because at that time, at the British archives, the um, the British uh, the British archives, they were closed for um, 50 years, and in India they were only closed for 30 years. So that you you know you, I couldn't go past 37 because I couldn't get into the archives in Britain. So that was uh, that. So anyway, I worked on princely states and what was happening to them at that time. And then I got, I was asked um, to do the uh, volume in the new Cambridge history of India on the princely states. So Cambridge is a big name and yeah. this was a project before what they would have, they would have essays in a book, but then um, 
uh, just essays on princely states or whatever. And so then I was doing that book. So that was what got me the invitation to go, um, and I think it was about 2008, to, and I, I will never forget it because um, I got to go to the, well, first of all, I got to go into various parts all over the DNA and talk to a lot of the curators and learned a lot from them. And then um, I got to go to the, uh, op the, you know, the private opening, not the one where some member of royalty was at the table. This was the, the, the more vast one. Yeah. And you know, I never thought I would be, and the British love champagne, and they just circulate, and you can have all the <laughs> champagne you want to drink and everything. And so I was very, uh, I knew very well, or I became great friends with the curator. So there was an after party going to be across the street in South Kensington. And so I went to her and I said, you want to walk over there together? And I said, you know where the room is, where it's going to be, and it was in the basement thing and everything. And so she said, well, I have to give back my diamonds first. And I thought she was wearing rhinestones. Because <laughs> I know curators don't make a lot of money. But Van Cliff and our pal was one of the sponsors of it. So she got to wear diamonds. Oh my goodness. But there was a man following her to make sure that no one, nothing happened to those diamonds. And I didn't, you know, he was just looking like, you know, he was someone looking at the art, but, or not, he wasn't looking at the art, he's just circulating. So yeah. he was looking at it. And so um, I did there. And then I was the keynote speaker at the symposium, and that was about three weeks later. And, you know, I never thought in my whole life that I would be introduced as the primary authority on the princely states oh, wow. in, in, in Britain because, yeah. you know, the British are very proud of their tradition and their graduates. So, you know, and I came from the University of Michigan. I wasn't from Harvard or Yale, you know. And, um, but I think I did very well at Michigan because I think Harvard or Yale was not ready for women. And I know they weren't ready for women when I went in the 60s. Right. Um, so, I mean, that was one thing that, you know, I'll never forget. And, and people still know it. Like, I just went to a um, workshop at the University of Leicester, and it was a, on the princely states. And so I was the oldest person there. And, but there was one young woman, and she said, and I read Barbara's book, and she really talks about how this one princely state, Bob Nugger, got the right to have the port from the British. And I thought, oh, I had even forgotten that. <laughs> and so, you, you know, so it's nice to know that, you know, your work has some longevity. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it, but I haven't done as much publication as some people because I was more active in, you know, organizations like, right. uh, and even like, you know, the research committee on Punjab, and then women's organizations too. And I really, uh, you know, helped when we were setting up the women's studies program. And now, it, you know, it's taken off and it's its own department, it's a Taft mm -hmm. department. And then I was head of Taft, um, which, you know, gave money. And that was always a very interesting experience because, um, w you know, working, we, we had this money to spend, but then I, we had to go and we reported to the TAF trustees. It's an arrangement that the university wouldn't have again in that we, right. get, the, we get the, pro, the TAF trustees give us money, but they still control the stock or whatever, you know, is throwing off this money or is, you know, pr producing the, the dividends, dividends yeah. that you know keep it going. So, how do you feel about TAF paying for a lot of the ANS courses rather than the ANS like college itself? Well, the thing is, you know, I I don't really know the inside story, and so it's hard for me to know what to do. I mean, the thing is that I have no idea now. You know, I used to know what. I mean, we used to get about forty-two. Um, and the thing is, I don't know about, you know, how much Taft is getting. And, I, and I've just heard little bits about the courses, so <clears throat> um, <coughs> how, how is that done? Oh, I mean, do they pay? I mean, because, I mean, it, it's a very complex thing if you're going to give money to the course. Yeah. And then also, you know, I know that they had more money to give than I did. Um, well, and see, that was another thing. Taft has existed 
<coughs> since the 1940s, <coughs> there was some problem because it, I think the deed was, uh, you know, signed in about like 1929. But then it got involved with, it was very complex, and so that there wasn't money coming off of it until sometime in the 1940s. Okay. And so I came here, and no one told me about Taft. No one told me. And I found out later that the head of Taft, the Taft, uh, not the Taft trustees, the Taft in the university, um, you know, they would tell it was all men. And they, they, the men knew about it, and my, the male, uh, you know, my, the men of my age or, you know, level of um, commitment in the department, they knew about it, but I didn't know about it. Mm. So then at one point, the Taft trustees <coughs> said they wanted to have an external evaluation. So they had an external evaluation. And they said that they um, wanted to open it up. And so to make it that there should be more publicity about it. So um, a woman uh, who, there was a woman on the board, um, whose name, she was from the French department, and a member of the uh, TAF, or somebody who was a TAF and a male, had told her about this and you apply and you can get money to, you know, go to do research and things like that. And um, none of my colleagues in history told me that. And they were on the TAF board. Mm -hmm. One was chair of the TAF board and shall remain nameless. But anyway, um, so then I had been at the Humanity Center and I got, and that's another thing, I, I got, um, there's a National Humanity Center in Chap, well, it's in the Research Triangle, you know, Chapel Hill, uh, where Duke is, and then um, North North Carolina, and that's sort of and th this um, this uh, tri triangle uh, was started as an effort in North Carolina to attract industry because tobacco was going down, and so they had a lot of um, medical uh, research there going on. But they also, there was a lobbying and there was a humanities center. So you applied nationally and there were about 40 people each year who got, uh, and they, they had people from India, like there was someone that I knew from India who was a very eminent professor of um, Indian painting. And <clears throat> it was like being in La La Land because if you wanted a book, you just gave a slip to somebody and they got the book from one of the three libraries for oh, wow. you. If you wanted your dessert, if you wanted your papers typed, they asked you, "Do you want the British system or do you want the American <laughs> system?" And you know, and they'll type the whole paper for you. Oh my goodness! And I hadn't had that, and so it, someone said it's like you're if you're you're like a kid in your lollipop land, and you would walk in in the morning, and there would be um, uh, all sorts of sort of snacky food, um, you know, muffins and bagels and things like this, and coffee. And then you had your lunch there, and there would be coffee pots, and you know, there w there wasn't an afternoon snack. But anyway, and you had your own private office, and you know, it was just like being in La La Land because, you know, it was so different. And it, it and so then when I came back, <clears throat> that was I think seventy six, seventy seven. When I came back, they were uh, Judy Meiskins was head of Taft. And so I said, you know, I think that this is really a good idea because at Chapel Hill, they have a research center on their campus. So we should have some sort of research center. And so we worked on that. And we wanted one where we could bring in people from the outside as well as inside. But there were all sorts of issues that I won't go into. Yeah. We don't say problems, we say issues. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, the thing is that, um, that really opened up Taft. Now, what happened, there were some people, including a couple of women, they would apply and they would get $2,000 a year in the summer. And they really didn't have, to, and I know from the records, they really didn't do much. So when Judy came in and she made me head of it, um, she said, okay, we're going to start having overseeing of the grants, you know, and well, there'll be a committee and you'll do it. Okay, and so then I said, well, 
you know, two thousand dollars, we should go up to four thousand, but we should make it competitive. Yeah. And then I said, also, we should have a supplement if you have to go and travel for your research, because if people are sitting in Cincinnati and doing their research, that's fine, but their expenses are much lower than, say, when I go to London, mm -hmm. or somebody goes to California or England or something. <coughs> Excuse me. So with Judy Meiskins and, my, and, and she, says, she said, okay, we'll be chair of the committee because you know how it works in North Carolina. I said, okay. So then I was the next chair of the Taft committee. And um, we, we were able to do a lot more to, to make it open. But, um, you know, and, you know, and to raise the stipends to make them competitive. Now, some people were unhappy and like one woman actually followed me into the restroom during the summer opera season <laughs> to castigate me. Really? Uh, because she, she had gotten something every year. And so now she wasn't getting it. And so I said, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, you're not getting it, but the, we, you know, we have to be more competitive. And um, you know it is more expensive if you're going to travel. So, but everybody got the four thousand, and then if you could get fifteen hundred, which wasn't going to pay for you know if you're spending the summer in London, or in Paris, or you know a, a big metropolitan city. Yeah. So, um, and it, it started uh, doing more. But you know I was there. I, I have to look at my paper to see when in the heck. I was there as um, director of uh, Taft. Oh, I was a Taft professor too. But um, the thing is that uh, you know I had a five-year term, and I, so I, uh, you know, I, I I really think that we put it. But then um, the political science professor who named when he took over, they, they really got uh, you know a sep They they were able to have a, a space and. You know, full-time staff and uh, Richard. What's Richard's last name? Anyway, and he's in political science, and he, uh, you know, was very good at really making the basis for what it could do now. Yeah. And so it was, but you know, just getting it publicity and establishing, you know, some rules about, uh, you know, that made were sensitive to the. You know various demands or the various requirements of faculty. Yeah, that uh, that took a lot, and you know, and then some people, um, you know, just didn't pay attention. And then when you didn't pay, like one of them called up and just was so upset with uh, the secretary, and and I could hear him, and he was going on and on about, you know, that he should not have to pay for his taxi where he was because he had to get to the archives and so that we should pay for a taxi. We don't pay for taxis. Yeah. You go public transportation or walk. And he, um, so then I had to call him and tell him that you, if you want to protest, you protest to me. <laughs> you protest to your equal, you don't protest to a subordinate person. And so, I mean, those are the types of things that you have, and sometimes, I mean, it really turns you off of being, a, you know, an administrative position like that. I bet. But you know, you, but you know, you, you just figure, well, those are the breaks of the game, and what am I going to do about it? Yeah. You know, and just don't think about it. So, a couple more questions. Uh, one, how did you feel about the system changing from quarters to semesters? Generally. I think it's a good idea because you have more time, particularly when I was teaching like, you know, the survey to do Indian history and I would say, okay, the Gupta Empire is the classical period. What's a classical period in someone's culture? And I would try to get out of them what, why we call, you know, the Greek and Roman yeah. a, a classical period. They didn't have too much on that. But um, the thing is, that uh, I really, how did I get off on classical period? Um, I would say, okay, this is the classical, uh, the, the Gupta is the classical. We've all, we already know what one empire looked like. We're going on. We have to spend more time on Islam and Hinduism and you know the Mughals and this sort of thing. So that um, it was hard to teach it in 
10 weeks, yeah. so that's good. I think what the problem was when it was done, it was done just at the time that everybody is saying, okay, you've got to you know, have more students, butts in the seat, and yeah. then you'll get paid. So then you have other colleges starting to teach English or social studies yeah. or things like that. And they're really doing it sort of a, a you know, but I would say it was a more high school level history or something. Yeah. And, so, and so then the, the enrollment in the humanities declined drastically because, and then, the, but the university was letting these other places, you know, get courses that would really be, belong best in the arts and sciences. And um, I think, you know, I don't know what happened to the, because, and I was on the council of department heads and things like that, so I used to know a lot of their problems too. Yeah. And so I know that they, you know, also have issues, but it, I, you know, I, I went on quarter, I mean, I went on, um, Michigan was on semesters, and so I think, it, it, I mean, it can be done, and I don't, and I think, you know, most places do have semesters, so, and, and I can see the value in it, but I think that my main concern about it, it happened just when the bottom was dropping out of uh, the humanities. Right. And but but I also think that people should take some humanities courses. Yeah. You know, whether it's history or English or, you know, a language course or in social sciences too. I mean, uh, and I don't know how they're doing. I I mean, I hear that you know, everybody has problems or issues, but you know, um, sociology and anthropology and you know, I, I just feel like to be a well-rounded person, if you're not going to get it here and get interested in it here, there are so many other things that are going to distract you, mm -hmm. or, or not just distract you, but take up your time. And so this is where I think, you know, it, we're really suffering for the humanities. Because if they're not going to get it here, they're not going to see it on the TV. Right. So what do you hope your students took away from your classes that you taught? I hope, because of what I was teaching, that it gave them insight to a culture different than their own. That, you know, the way we do things isn't the only way to do things. I'm not saying that some of the things that go on in India are better than here. I have questions about, I mean, concerns about, I shouldn't have questions, I have concerns about their prime minister. <laughs> and um, so I, you know, I really think that arts and science, you know, and, but look, arts and science building has never, the McMicken, which we don't know how long that's going to be, mm -hmm. has never been totally revamped. Education has. But frankly, I don't think the education college, it's very important, but I don't think it has the sort of, um, I don't know what I want to say, that I think arts and science deserves a better building. Yeah. I mean, you know, because every time I go in there, and I remember the bathrooms were terrible. When I was department head, I took Joe Scanio in there, and I said, listen, we, we, we have uh, water sitting in our sinks. That's breeding, you know, yeah. this. Well, and I also had to take him in because we had one very tall woman who had a hip thing, and she needed a raised <laughs> toilet seat. And I thought, the jobs you get when you're department head, <laughs> taking in this mail to the women's restroom, and say, okay, Joe, we need to get this fixed. And, you know, it didn't, well, he, he sort of fixed that, but you couldn't get the fountains, or the they finally had fixed the sinks because a, a friend came over from DAP from fashion design and she was auditing my course and she went in my sinks and she said I've been in India and I haven't seen anything as bad as this <laughs> and I said well just this is McMicken yeah. so I think that um, you know I, I, I think that it's great that we have these good departments in other areas that we you know and we, we have you know Afri African studies we have um, you know a lot of new new things Judaic studies, uh, women's studies, yes, I think that's very good, but at the same time, you know, I just get upset. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm arts and science. Um, and, but, you know, I know we're not unique in that, and I don't know, you know, what's going to happen. 
Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we've had too much turmoil at the top levels in terms of people not staying long. And so I think that's difficult. Yeah. And I, and I think the university, you know, is somebody who, you know, I think they're worth their money if they're doing well because it is a very time consuming job. And, you know, I was involved in enough things where I got a sense of, you know, how those people operate or, you know, how they have to operate, shall we say. Yeah. But, you know, I, now that I'll probably get feedback from this, but I, I, I'm a graduate fellow. And so I go to the meetings of the graduate fellows. And we have uh, uh, twice a year, and one is when the new people come in, and then the other is to have speakers and, uh, you know, somebody, one, one time when there's a speaker from the university administration. And we had a dean, uh, like a university type dean, I won't mention, yeah. and he talked for an hour and never once mentioned the humanities. And then there was sort of a start of a talk session, and I thought, well, I have to go to the bathroom, but I'm going to say something. <laughs> and so I said, you know, there was no mention of anything related to the humanities, or sort of really even the sciences and arts and science, because what they're talking about is we have to do more research, we have to, you know, in, um, we have to do things that will bring in money, yeah. not just have, uh, and I agree, we need that, we need that. I mean, uh, so that we, we need to have that, you know, and I'm, I'm in graduate fellows, there's a lot of people from medicine in there, and I go to a lot of things over, because I'm interested in the history of medicine, because my current research is on efforts to improve uh, maternal and infant mortality rates in and maybe I said this earlier. Yeah. And, and so the thing is that I, you know, I, I'm at the medical school, and I think they, you know, deserve everything they're getting. But at the same time, we should also mention that, you know, they're getting, and and they do have now a program in medicine in the humanities, because I think that when you're in medicine, you know, you should know something about the human. Right. You know, the human side of it. But, you know, I want, I want my surgeon to be very well trained yeah. and very steady <laughs> right. when, you know, they're doing it. So I, you know, I, I don't, um, but I just think that there needs to be, um, you know, more attention. And, you know, and I think, you know, if you walk in McMicken, you know, it looks like 1950s. Right. And, you know, you go into the, you know, the education, or, and I haven't even been in the new business college, so I can't imagine what's there. But I, so, you know, I, I think, you know, and, and, and I know that I probably could have gotten more writing done if I wasn't as interested in, you know, women's issues, liberal arts, you know, do things externally, because, you know, I, I really enjoyed being you know, on the Council of the American Historical Association. And, you know, you learn a lot about what's happening. And in the, um, you know, the Asian Studies group. And I was active for a while in women's studies, but it, it got to be too much of an overload. And so, you know, I, I give them a little money, not much, but a little money. And I go to some of their events, but it's hard to keep up with everything. And so, but, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I feel very privileged that I've had my career at UC and, you know, that I've been asked to do things that were, I think, helpful to people and, you know, that people think that they learned something. And um, because, I mean, I knew what I was teaching was very different than what else they were doing. So that, um, you know, it was going to be hard or, you know, and it was, or let's say it's going to be challenging to them, but I tried to help them. And I think that, you know, I don't know how many, you know, never came up and said that they thought, you know, I did an interesting class or they learned something. And like, I think I said, you know, one time this fellow who had come back from being in um, Afghanistan, or I don't know where exactly he was, but it was towards the tail end and, you know, said, you know, I really wish I had this course before I went there. Right. And so I think that, like for Vietnam too, to know, you know, to know what's happening, and you know, to know India because, like a lot of people now, Procter and Gamble, for a long time it was just Colgate, 
in India, and you couldn't get anything, you know, from Procter and Gamble. But now, when about oh, two, my last time when I was living there, two o six o seven, there things were starting to get in the market. And now, when I've been back for short things, you see much more of Procter and Gamble. And there's Procter and Gamble there. There is Cincinnati Bell there. There's all of these things. And so I think that, you know, if you're going to whatever you're going to do in this world that you should know something about other parts of the world. And um, not that I you know, think everything is hunky-dory in India. Right. I have all sorts of problems. And um, you know, I've, I've seen improvements in things that have to do with women. And, um, but at the same time, I know there's a long way to go. And there's a lot of people, uh, more, even more than here, you know, who have not gotten the benefit of modernization or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Or, you know, even schooling. I mean, you know, when you see, you know, if you're in, and I don't travel that much in villages now, but, um, you know, when you went to villages, and it, I mean, the, you know, some people's lives are n not very comfortable or, you know, safe for, you know, a variety of things. That's unfortunate. And that's very unfortunate. And I know it's happening in my country, too. So don't, you know, throw stones uh, here. So is there anything about, anything more about UC you'd like to talk about? Um, I think that you can get a really good education at UC. Mm -hmm. And I think some people think it's, well, you know, I didn't get into OSU or this place or that place. But I think that, you know, so much good has happened that if you're willing to, you know, and, and okay, so you get one class that isn't going anywhere. If you can, drop it. But if you can't, then just, you know, talk, ask people around yeah. or, you know, go and talk to the professor. Now, the thing is that I don't see professors around that much, and I don't know whether they do a lot on email or anything, but I always, I, I like interaction with people. Yeah. So I would be, you know, there would be days I would want to have a day home, you know, to prepare for things or a half day to prepare for things. But um, I, in his department, that I was in the office so much more than some others were. Um, and, you know, so I know that there are things that I could have, you know, I probably could have gotten more published. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't. I didn't necessarily go in to be a publishing star. Mm -hmm. And for me, writing is very difficult. I do a lot of drafts. And so it isn't that, you know, there are some people who, you know, are much more able to do that than I. And um, some people, I think, who necessarily don't give all their t t teaching to. And I, I did try to do that. But I think it was difficult sometimes for students because, you know, they, you just didn't know about it. Now you know much more about India. Because you, you can see them around town, mm -hmm. you can see them in you know running for president of the or of Indian background, Indian heritage, yeah. running for you know political office, mm -hmm. and um, so I think you know I, I find it very interesting to you know see how that has played out over the years, and you know because you didn't you didn't know an Indian. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I went to the University of Michigan, I did, and actually at my college, um, and I was, you know, in a Catholic women's college, and did I talk about how my professor was the one who told me I could go on and get the PhD? So that, you know, I think that, um, you know, you, you're, you're, you, you can be fortunate for, you know, what people do. And I just feel that, you know, I've been very fortunate. And I mean, there were there were times when I was department that I thought, this is a stupid thing to be doing, <laughs> or it's you know it's it's too hurtful because yeah. you know you can't necessarily do everything for people that they want done. Right, it sounds frustrating. Yeah, so that could be frustrating, but um, and you know I, I I I just feel like I had a very rich life and yeah. you know I wish I could get more writing done now, but you know. <laughs> I'm surrounded by books and this and that, and you know, and I get off onto things. And so, but you know, I really feel very blessed that I've been able to do this because I know a lot of people don't. And I think, you know, 
it's in the United States because I mean I got a, a grant from the federal government for three years to study Hindi and Indian history and Indian political science and then I had to take Michigan and, and I mean I'm glad I'm, I was in Michigan and I had to have a field of you know pre-1500 and so I took the Renaissance but now people I think get so focused on what their project is mm -hmm. and so you know I think if you're having a liberal education it's good to know a little bit about something else and then I came back through when I, I went around the world and when I was coming back from my dissertation uh, research I went to Florence for three days now I was three yeah I was in Rome for three and a half days I was in Florence for three and a half days and unfortunately I had lower digestive tract problems so I could only have um, uh, I had minestrone <laughs> and bread <laughs> and I thought the whole time in India I was thinking oh I can hardly wait because there was no Indian I mean there's no Italian food in India now now there's pizza every place <laughs> um, and there's been pizza most places for a long time um, so the, the, the thing is that I just feel, you know, I mean, that, I'm not saying that there weren't times that I thought, mm, why did I do this? Yeah. But, you know, it was more or less. And I like working with people. I, I think I am a people person, too. So yeah. I like working with people. So any other questions? <laughs> I think that's about it for me. Any final thoughts you want to add to this interview? No, I just, I, I think that, you know, you should encourage people, you know, to do, to explore things. I, I think that's what I would say, that you know, you should explore things. And have, I didn't have um, much self-confidence. Yeah. And I, because my parents were from another generation and everything, and I didn't have, and so my faculty advisor said, you know, to me when I was in the um, uh, undergraduate, you know, you don't have any, and I said, well, I don't know, I just don't have, you know, because I would always think, well, I'm not doing good enough or, you know, yeah. I could do better. And so it's good for some time for people to say, yes, you are doing good. And yeah, you know, it does, you know Rome wasn't made in a day, so <laughs> this isn't going to do. And, you know, and I know I have to write many drafts of a paper or a book and, you know, that it takes me a long time. I'm not somebody who can sit down and zip it off. But, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm happy that people are still reading my book on, you know, the Indian princes. Yeah. And um, I'm still happy that, you know, occasionally someone will come up to me and like, oh, some fella at one of the beer places said, you know, I had a course from you. And I don't know, it was, it was, it was I think someone's wedding up there or something, and he saw my name tag and he, you know, said, I said oh, I hope grade was okay. He said, well, it was sort of okay. <laughs> but, you know, um, you, you know, you just, uh, you know, you just hope that, you know, other people can enjoy what you did too. Yeah. So that's why, you know, because I'm giving money to UC and, and, and money to my undergraduate college too, because I, you know, my parents had, did, we had five children and they said, well, the girls will get married and somebody will take care of them. And so we'll let, we'll send the boys, the two boys, to college. And I said, okay, I want to get, you know, yeah. go to college. So I worked for two years at the telephone company and the service representative. Like, I would, you'd come in and we'd talk about getting your telephone. And then if you didn't pay your bill, I called you and told you what was going to happen. Yeah. And so either way, I didn't have always happy people. But anyway, I, so I worked for two years and then I went to, to college and I was taking night courses while I was working and I went to Alberno College and I um, was able to get through in three years. But my faculty advisor was the one who helped me apply and, you know, so that's why I worked a lot with my graduate students too, to, uh, you know, so that they can be competitive because you've been on the other side of judging so you know what they're looking for. Right. So that that's good, and you know, so I you know, so I feel satisfied. I guess that's the way to. And I think that you know, I did well at Cincinnati. There there were there are things that I don't necessarily agree with, but I think and I think students can get a very good education here. 
now I, I don't say in every department, but I think that you know if you know if you you know and I would tell people if if it's not going well and you think you you're not going to like it, try something else. Yeah. And you know don't because I think people become bitter when they think they're stuck in something. Right. And so you want to just say you have to try. Now I realize that you know that there are major groups of people who don't have that. Um, ability to try something else too, and so you know our United States has a lot of issues. We don't have problems; we have issues, <laughs> and unfortunately, you know some of them aren't getting any better. So you know, we just and you know so I worry about that. I do worry about politics, but you know I can't do too much about it right. except vote. So I'll do that. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's about it. Thank and you thank so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you too for coming <laughs> and asking the questions and everything. <laughs> of course. <laughs>